Great, we're um, about to start. I think it's, um, it's uh, now two minutes past. Um, so um, welcome everyone to the Net Zero Challenge Pitch Contest. Um, we um, have um, about 30 people logged in from all around the world, which is really exciting. Um, this event um, has been in the planning now for over six months, so I'm super excited to get going. Um, but I first, just, I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping and some instructions and introductions. Um, so a quick um, introduction to the moderators of today's event. Um, I'm James Hamilton. I'm the development manager from Open Knowledge Foundation and also the director of the Net Zero Challenge project. Uh, we also have Stephen Abbott Pugh, who is Open Knowledge's content development manager and also the director of Open Knowledge Foundation's Open Data Day team. So Stephen and I are going to be moderating today's event. So if you have any questions or comments, you can direct them to us um, on the chat. Uh, next slide, please, Stephen. Great, thanks. Um, so a quick introduction about the Net Zero Challenge. The aim of the project um, was to identify, promote, and support innovative, practical, and scalable uses of open data that um, understand climate risks, track climate progress, enable informed climate action, and evaluate climate impact. We hope that this is just the first phase of a much larger multi-year project to support people and organizations using open data to advance climate action. You can find out more um, at, the, at netzerochallenge.info. Um, the Net Zero Challenge is a project of the Open Knowledge Foundation. We are a UK-based not-for-profit with a mission to create a fair, free, and open future. We have extensive experience and expertise related to legal, technical, and community aspects of open data. And we provide consultancy research community management, technical solutions for a wide variety of clients. Um, the Net Zero Challenge has been supported by two partners, Microsoft and the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. We're extremely grateful for their support. Uh, we couldn't have created this project without their collaboration. So both Microsoft and the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office took a risk backing this project when it was just at a concept stage. So we're extremely grateful to both of them. Um, I also want to thank two individuals um, at two different organizations who have provided important strategic advice for the project. Uh, Natalia Kafi at the Open Data Charter and Richard Tubb at Transport for New South Wales. So both Richard and Natalia have been extremely generous with their time providing guidance to the Net Zero Challenge delivery team. Uh, we couldn't have done it without you, so thank you. Um, so a quick introduction to today's event, uh, how it's going to work, the program. Um, next slide, please, Stephen. Great. So we have five teams pitching their projects today. Each team has three minutes to present their work and ideas. Some of the pitches have been pre-recorded. Some will be delivered live. So um, after each three minute pitch, we're going to run a Q&A session for up to seven minutes. Um, the questions will come firstly from the panel of experts, who I'm going to introduce in a minute, but we also encourage the audience to ask questions in the chat channel. So if you have a question for any of the pitch uh, teams, uh, please put it in the chat. Stephen and I will keep an eye out on the chat and put the questions to the pitch team after their three minute pitch. Um, you can see from this timetable that we've given each uh, team a maximum of 10 minutes. So that's three minutes of the pitch, seven for a Q and A. Depending on the number of questions, we may run faster than this timetable. We won't run any slower. So we are going to finish on the hour. Um, so a little introduction to the pitch teams. Um, the pitch teams come from five different countries, Australia, France, South Africa, Argentina, and Brazil. So four different continents. So it's a, today's a really wonderful global event. Um, I wanna thank all of the teams for the hard work they've put into their projects and pitches today. It's very inspiring to see people from around the world using open data to advance climate action. I'm really looking forward to learning more about their visions and their projects today. 
Um, this event is being held in English, so I want to extend an extra thanks to the teams who are not pitching in their native language. So for those who will forgive my pronunciation, um, bon chance au français, buena suerte a los argentinos, and boa sorchas brasileros. And good luck to everyone else, everyone. Um, the pitches today are going to be judged by our panel of experts. We're extremely grateful for, um, for all of them for their support for the Net Zero Challenge. Our panel of judging panel of experts today are Natalia Carfi from the Open Data Charter, Meng Ping Ge from the World Resources Institute, Eleanor Stewart from the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, and Bonnie Lay from Microsoft's AI for Earth. So, and finally, um, the winning team are going to uh, receive a prize uh, of a thousand US dollars, uh, which I checked today will buy you 15.7 barrels of oil today. Um, and 0 0.164 bitcoins. If um, we hope you're going to, if you win the prize, that you use the money to invest in your project. Um, uh, we won't be announcing the winner um, in the event today. We'll be announcing it later in the week. So um, that's all from me. Um, um, uh, next slide, um, Steve. Um, and the, actually, the one after that. <laughs> uh, we're ready for the first pitch. So um, uh, the order of the pitches today, we're running um, with the snapshot um, um, team from Australia first. So Matt, I wonder if you uh, are ready to go. Ready to go. I'm gonna put up my deck. Just yeah, just a quick reminder. Um, uh, there's a three-minute limit to your pitch. Mm -hmm. No worries. Uh, ready to. to Great. Go, go for it. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Mate. Thank you. Okay, well, hi everyone. My name is Matt Sullivan. I am uh, presenting for the Snapshot Climate Portal uh, for uh, uh, for the Net Zero Challenge. So, uh, initially, I'd like to make an acknowledgement of Patrick for elders past and present and extend that respect to all First Nations people. So, the Snapshot Community Climate Tool is a web portal that presents information about carbon emissions for cities uh, that is compliant with international standards. It was developed in conjunction between Ironbox Sustainability, my consulting firm, and Beyond Zero Emissions, a leading national uh, non for profit uh, tackling carbon emissions mitigation. This is an example of the web portal. Um, this is a city, original city in Australia and some of the data they would see. Uh, it's just a fairly visual breakdown of the type of emissions that occurs in that municipality of all the key emission sectors and presents a lot of supporting data as well. It also has um, connected to this website all of the supporting methods and data sources that is used. Um, to ensure maximum transparency and repeatability of the, and the analytical processes. We utilize um, the leading international standards for the determination of emissions to ensure maximum intercompatibility as uh, using like the GPC standards um, and other IPCC data sources. We also collaborate closely with key data providers, including Google and energy distributors to improve granularity of the data provision. Ultimately, the impact of this is faster and better decisions. We developed this tool because getting information about municipal data was one of the key barriers for engagement of stakeholders, uh, both communities and cities. And this tool enables them to move on to action, taking the genuine steps for, um, for reducing emissions. It also improves collaboration and uh, it uh, increases the number of participants engaged in mitigation actions. And we see this in our user feedback. We've been operating um, a version of this web portal for up around two years now. And we've got extensive feedback indicating this has really transformed community groups all across Australia in their abilities to deliver change. So we've uh, rolled out the tool all across Australia to 540 local government areas, which is everyone. And um, we also designed this tool very fundamentally to be scalable so that, um, that we would, we are interested in, in exploring applications and working internationally to try and bring some of the benefits that we've seen to the uh, to other countries. Our next six months, we're going to focus on increasing the granularity of the regional areas, so electorates and uh, state level data to access, make CSV data downloads more accessible 
increase the types of information available, such as utility costs and jobs data, and improve data visualization. Longer term, we have strategic goals of integrating science drive targets into the tool, improving um, spatial data, but also making concrete steps towards empirical evaluation of uh, interventions being pursued by these uh, entities so that we can move towards better practice nationally and globally. So thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, that was great. Um, I wonder if we have any uh, questions for uh, Matt. So James, I'm looking, I can't see, there's no questions I don't think from the panel of experts. Um, if anyone has got a question, if you want to put it in the, the chat field now, then we can put that to Matt in the next couple of minutes. Cool, could I just unmute myself and, and ask the question? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Perfect, thank you so much for that presentation, Matt. Can you chat a little bit more about whether, it's again, very impressive that you've already got adoption in 540 local, local governments. Can you chat a little bit about in, in across those 540 cases, where have you seen the greatest resistance to adoption and where it was difficult to convince a government to use and whether or not you've thought about those issues as you're thinking about scaling internationally? Sure, that's a great question. So the main resistance has been in instances of where say cities or municipalities have prepared alternate profiles or put alternate methods uh, for developing the inventories. Um, what we found is that um, there's of the 540 country, uh, sorry, municipality, a very small handful have actually um, decided against utilizing our standardized methods of determining emissions. And we actually have a facility to make their alternate data sets available through our portal. Um, where that's got to is that um, although they have taken that step uh, for all of them, except for one city so far, they've actually uh, for the next year's update, they're actually going to move to our model because of the ease of doing it, the, the zero cost of it doing it, and the uh, the fact that it becomes compatible with their neighbors, and also that it has baked into it the metrics associated with monitoring and evaluation that we are that we are rolling out. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. Great, I'm just looking around. Uh, do any of the other panel of experts have any questions that they, they want to put to Matt? Yeah, can I just ask, uh, Stephen and Helena, um, thanks for that, Matt. Can I just ask, have you got any examples of, uh, you didn't have time in three minutes, I appreciate it, which is why I'm asking, but, but have you got any examples of how the portal has led to an end result and impacted on the climate? change and whether where, where there's an action that's gone through and actually you can directly link it to the information on your portal well that is a great question so i actually find that the link between carbon emissions inventories and genuine emissions reducing action to be tenuous so like it's uh not entirely like there's not like a robust relationship generally established what i can say is that um, it has mobilized many more stakeholders to participate in this process and it has enabled them to work regionally. So we've seen a substantive move towards regional types of approaches um, being employed and that, that is generally the types of conversations we're engaged with these days. Uh, the question that you're asking, fundamentally, it drills down to something that is, uh, it's kind of what I'm really trying to do. So like this, this, um, inventory stuff is kind of like a gateway. So um, to be able to understand what constitutes effective intervention, you need to uh, be able to perform realistic evaluation of initiatives. And generally with cities, this is very problematic because there are, they are so sophisticated and they're so complex and you can't essentially run like isolated tests in them. To, and to resolve that, you need to to have a lot of cities testing under the same sort of circumstances to be able to get some sort of idea about what's 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 attributable to your interventions. That's one of the key reasons why it's so important for me to have all of the cities talking to the same language when they develop their inventories. And like when I say that we're connecting to the monitoring evaluation framework, that's what I mean. I mean like that they're 
all utilizing the same data and methods, which means when we see a variance that we can correct for cohort group matching, that means we can much, much more confidently attribute it to the actual effect of an intervention rather than simply the many, many other factors that it would be more plausible under alternate strategies, such as just simply very subtle variations in methods or chosen you know, conversion coefficients and things. So it's a complex question to answer, but like ultimately we are far further down the road of being able to genuinely say we are driving effective change at the city level. Thanks, okay, Matt. Thank you, Matt. We have two minutes um, before we have to move to the next pitch. I actually have a question in writing here. Yeah, can, there's a question from uh, Robbie Morrison that's been put on the chat. Is that the one you're talking about, Matt? Yes. Yeah, yep. okay. So um, for everyone so who can is... see, it's a, it says, can you comment on how much the material is under statutory reporting, meaning that this is a legal requirement? There is no legal requirement in Australia to report emissions at, this, at the municipal level. So zero. But the, uh, there are some of the data sets that we utilize uh, for preparing these profiles is subject to, um, well, only a small proportion is legal requirements, but a number of them are done through state or national level mechanisms. Okay, fantastic. Um, I, no, I don't think there's any more questions. So we're, oh, wait, there is one more question. <laughs> Can you um, explain major missing data gaps? Yeah. Uh, so as in like ones that you saw on the screen just now or just in general, like, is it? Yeah, areas, um, hi, areas that you think, uh, our, our priorities for you to expand into or get better information uh, on. Absolutely, I can I can I, was, I could be at it all day. There's uh, lots of ways that we can improve granularity. Um, one of the main areas that I want to make a focus is in land use emissions, because I feel that they are somewhat underrepresented in the way that uh, the data sets we can access represent those types of emissions. Um, there's also in stationary energy, we are making some major moves to work with some uh, state level data aggregators to be able to get better. Um, to say, you have to finish up now. Oh, wrap up? Okay. Well, yes, there are gaps and we work very heavily on them. Great. Thank you so much, Matt. And thank you for all those amazing questions. Um, 10 minutes is such a short time, um, but really great. Um, 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 presentation and great questions, great explanation. So our next pitch is um, Saif, uh, Carbon Geo Scales. Saif, um, are you ready to share your screen and present? Yeah. Oh. Great. Okay, now. Thank you, Matt. Is it okay? Yes, we can see your screen share. Okay, let's go. Go for it. So. So hi everybody, I am uh, Saif Shabu, I represent Carbon Geoscales, which is a project uh, with a strong synergy with the Snapshot project. And I think we are trying to provide easy access to open data to projects like Snapshot, which is the aim, the objective of this type of, of, of our project. So I am a data scientist with experience with uh, data products management, and uh, I contribute with an open source community for the development of Carbon Geoscales. So our project has been set recently by a French program called Data for Good, which supported us by connecting with data specialist volunteers. And our team is now composed of 16, 16 data scientists and engineers. So reducing greenhouse gas emissions is very important challenge, uh, climate change challenge. And we believe that the importance of providing easy access of multi-scale open data for helping policy making at different territorial scales. Despite the availability of rich carbon emissions data, their use remains complex for different reasons, such as differences in normalizations, in spatial temporal coverage, in data formats. So therefore, Carbon Geoscales attempts to tackle these difficulties by providing a centralized access point to harmonize carbon emissions multi-scale data and providing data access to data processing pipelines through an open source collaborative framework. The schema presents the data workflow of our solution. So first, we identified the major emission open data providers at different geographical scales, including the WRI, the Carbon Disclosure Project, and EDGAR High Resolution Emission Database. These data sets are explored and documented in order to feed a data catalog shared with the community. These data sets 
are integrated in our data lake with respect to standardized data model. And then different data processing pipelines are implemented in order to feed a harmonized multi-scale carbon emission database. So data are exposed to external application by the means of an open API. And different uh, data users profiles have been identifying such as policy makers, carbon accounting specialists, and data journalists. And our roadmap is composed of two phases. The first phase, prototyping phase, as part of Data for, for Good program in order to deliver a first version of our, our solution. And then a second phase for industrializing our, uh, our prototype. So uh, the tasks are classified into three categories. Those related to the inventory of data provider use cases and data sets in order to build a data catalog. Then tasks related to data processing pipeline development to feed a comprehensive database. And then the tasks related to data exposure to build and deploy carbon geoscale API. Improvements are planned in the second phase by integrating new data sets, industrialize and improve performance, and integrate possibility to integrate data sets in our API. Our goal is to continue growing this open source community and inviting more contributors to collaborate in our framework by referencing and integrating emissions data providers provided at their local territorial space. Thank you for your attention. Great. Thanks, Saif. I'm just looking to see if there's any questions. Um, if any of the panel of expert have, experts have questions, do you want to unmute yourself and, and ask? Um, can I start? Absolutely, go for it. Sure. Um, I just want to start in saying I really I like the idea. And from somebody who works on the right data set that you have included in your project, I have to say this is one of the most frequently asked type of questions that we get from the users. I guess my question hinges on, um, is, I, this is very important that we acknowledge and uh, recognize that there are differences and uncertainties that are associated with emission numbers and with methodology and online data sources and accounting methodologies, they can be different. I guess the real um, value added next to it is to understand why there is difference and what we can do about it. And I guess comes to your project, my question would be once you have your project finished and done, you, you now you have all the data sets and process and you, you see the differences. What would you do to say reach out and engage with your types of target audiences and to influence the stakeholders to make the decisions that will likely deliver actual emission reductions? Thanks. Okay. Thank you for the question. So actually our, our goal unit is to be in the back end. So to provide easy access to people who can use this data to make uh, climate actions. So we understood and we, we discovered and discussed with some users of uh, carbon emissions data. And we understood that there is a problem with uh, standards, with schemas, with uh, accessibility, with data formats. So our perimeter is to identify the data, build a way to a data model you know, to combine these different scales and provide a data catalog to document all this data and provide them access, easy access to documented data in different scales. And we are thinking that it will be, it will be helpful for them because it will reduce their work on looking for this data and it will be helpful for them to make easier uh, climate actions. So our, our work stops in providing very relevant data and reliable data. Thanks. Thanks, Saif. Are there any other members of the, the expert panel who want to ask a question? If not, then there's a question that's been posted in the chat. I'll pop in quickly and again, super impressive for, for all of our presenters with only three minutes time to cover all this material. And I may have missed this, um, but could you mention how much usage have you seen of your platform so far? Um, and have you had, have you gotten any feedback from those users? Okay, so I go back for the roadmap. Actually, we started working in this project two months ago, so we don't have uh, feedbacks right now, but we start to contact people like Global Carbon Project to discuss, is in discussing with us to integrate their data. And we are discussing with some research laboratory in France. So we don't have enough feedbacks, but we are planning to start feedbacks after looking for taking and collecting feedbacks after the first prototype. 
but now what we did, we, we did the inventory of data, we did the inventory of data providers, we just started the development of the data model and the exploration, and we started the mapping and the building of our database. So we are in this phase, and uh, we are hoping to start to finish our first uh, prototype in June, and starting from June, we start. We are looking for users feedbacks, and we by counting the query of our API and to have more information about their needs in order to integrate maybe new data sets or to combine this data with other information or to integrate some other schema. Thank I you, Sarah. One, one quick I short question, one more if I minute. may. <laughs> um, so who do you foresee as your final end user? Like who is the project aimed to? Then anybody can log into the, the API, but who did you think about? Okay, so this is, this is what you put uh, in the users bar. So we are thinking more about carbon accounting specialists, uh, both from academia, like scientists, and from the private sector. So uh, specialists in carbon accounting because they are looking for different data, they are, they are collecting this data, they are processing this data, and we think that it would be easier for them to have one access point standardized for the standardized data. And then for policymakers, because they integrate data in their data portal, and they have a lot of data, but they can't make, we think that it's hard now to make decisions with this data because you can't combine different scales and you don't have enough information to compare cities. It's, we are in the same problematic like snapshot per project. You can't compare the different cities because the data in the city level are very complex to, to integrate and to find. So our aim is to be uh, to provide them with the possibility to compare cities and uh, with, with different uh, information and properties like GDP, population from all around the world. And we are thinking about now we are finishing in the API, but we are planning to to, to, to continue our work because we have like part of exploration of our data, communication of our articles, our generating of articles. So maybe it can be helpful for data journalists to have one, only one access point of uh, data related to carbon emissions. Great, thanks, Aid. I think we've run out of time, but there's a question from Robbie Morrison. If you wanted to check in the chat, maybe you could answer it there. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so our um, next presenter um, is Jeremy Dickens, and Jeremy has submitted a, a video that I'm going to play now so that everyone can see that. Uh, and so then there'll be questions after that. Thank you, Sai, for a great presentation, and thank you for all the questions. Hello, I'm Jeremy Dickens. Thank you for this opportunity to present to you my project to develop an avian index of tropical forest health to promote sustainable forest use and combat climate change. Tropical forests play a key role in climate regulation, given the ability of trees to store carbon as they grow. Therefore, deforestation leads to the release of this carbon into the atmosphere, contributing to climate change, and is the second largest source of human emissions worldwide. On the other hand, the sustainable use of forests is one of the most cost-effective climate solutions with the potential to absorb up to 30% of these emissions. As such, it is a key target of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. However, current forest indicators, namely forest area, provides little information on the condition of the biological communities they contain or ecological function. This lack of information makes it difficult for enterprises in these regions to manage resources sustainably. On the other hand, Millions of birdwatchers around the world, including myself, star observations on digital platforms, creating the largest biodiversity databases on Earth. The largest of these is eBird, a platform at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which has logged nearly 1 billion records by 700,000 users and continues to grow exponentially at around 20% a year. The potential uses of this data are thus enormous. Given that biodiversity forms the basis of ecosystems, this data contains valuable information on their health. The question is, how to extract this information. We therefore propose the development of a simple biomonitoring tool that uses the birds present to provide crucial information on forest health, sources of impact and trends in these factors in a way that is rapid, inexpensive and easy to use. 
we will thus create an index of bird sensitivities to human impacts. This will be followed by extensive field surveys to calibrate indicator variables with actual forest conditions represented as four to five simple eco status categories. We will then apply this to open data to generate a continuously updated online map of forest conditions at scale. This tool and map would enable more informed decision making to promote sustainable forest use, including goal setting. It thus provides a powerful means to track progress towards achieving sustainable forest use, making it ideal as an indicator for sustainable development goal 15. It also provides a means to evaluate the impacts of climate change on tropical forests themselves, enabling a better understanding of the risks associated with these changes. I hope to carry out this research as a PhD at one of the indicated universities starting later this year. We have chosen Latin America as the study region due to its crucial role in climate stability, although there is potential for later expansion. As such, we have agreements with local partners to assist with data acquisition and are requesting funding from multiple sources. For cloud computing, you require technical support, so I hope to work with eBird and apply for a Microsoft AI for Earth grant. Once developed, we will publish our tool and research and launch the online map and hope to incentivize their use by working with key players in the region and achieving policy relevance. Therefore, we would like to invite the organizations present to join in this exciting venture to take climate action using open data. Sorry, I was muted there. So th I say thank you very much to Jeremy for recording that. Um, Jeremy's here to answer any questions now. So uh, I will check to see if we've got any questions from, uh, if any of the panel of experts want to post any questions to Jeremy, please just unmute yourself and, and ask. Yeah, can I, it's Eleanor again. Thanks, Jeremy. It's really interesting. Can I just probe a bit? Because I've never heard of eBird. Actually, it's quite interesting. I might have to go and look at it. Anyway, um, so you've got a new customer to eBird. But, but is there a link? I mean, presumably the open data on eBird, well, eBird already has open data, and there must be a link between that and forest sustainability. Is the research outlining that and drawing those conclusions and making that available and understandable. Is that already open? Because I just don't know enough about that area. And is that something that this could all feed into? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so basically the method we're wanting to use is, is one of biomonitoring, which is it's used in other, um, with like with fresh water, it's, it's particularly well used, um, where you use organisms present and you can get a, a measure of, how, of the health of the ecosystem. So we're basically trying to use that for the first time in forests themselves because it hasn't been done um it hasn't really been done for any terrestrial system so this would be a first in that regard i would love to jump in here jeremy number one absolutely please do apply for an ai for earth grant we would love to see your your application your project is a, is a great fit for the program um followed up with the question i'd love to understand i know there are a couple of different research projects that are looking at various biodiversity indicators some looking at bird populations some looking at other wildlife species yeah. as a proxy for for ecosystem health can you chat a little bit about how you think your approach may be different from some of those existing um, existing research already underway or some of the tools that um, that are already out there? Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, I mean, there already are a few projects, especially using bird data, looking at changes in population um, and movements. So it's more to do with the ecology of the birds themselves. Um, there's the PREDICT project in Europe that uses open data in Europe um, for these purposes. but our, ours diff, our, our aims differ because um, we're looking more at the sensitivity of the birds to certain impacts. Um, so like each bird would be scored and I would use, give different impacts for different, sorry, different scores for different impact types. So you could almost have like a scoring system for habitat loss versus for poaching pressure versus for invasive species. Um, so you get a more complete picture um, of the kinds of impacts that are present at the site as well. Um, and obviously all of that impacts the, the sustainability of the forest and its ability to store carbon. 
Jeremy, we've got a question now from, um, from one of the people who's joined us, which is saying, um, this is Robbie Morrison, some bird reports are locked to protect individual birds, but this information may well signify important ecological information. Is this hidden data an issue? Um, sure. I'm not, I'm not too sure about that in eBird actually. And um, I know that they are, they do hide data from public view, but I'm, I'm sure there must be, I, I'm not too sure about the specifics, but there must be ways that you can access the data to um, use it for this. Um, but 99% of the species, and especially the ones that are relevant, um, you know, for telling forest health, um, the data is pretty widely available. Um, okay, great, thank you. Um, and uh, Fiona Nielsen has also said, could you share um, your contact details? So maybe you can do that in the chat so you can send her a message afterwards. <laughs> so she missed it on the, the final slide. Are there any more questions from the yeah, panel experts? Yeah, there's a couple in the, um, I see there's oh, a request to share the last slide. Is it possible to? Um, well, if, you, if you're able to go into the chat and share your contact details, I think that's what Fiona was is asking uh, for there. Yeah. Okay, sure. I, I have a quick question that is more on the yeah. how tech media is working and scalability of the project. And first of all, I really love the idea and not being an expert. Um, I'm just wondering, is the embassy of bird sensitive um, links to the climate change, is that an established embassy or so you're trying to create a methodology to evaluate this and relevant to this to the scalability is um, part of it. I'm just wondering how how would you separate, for example, if you're scaling it initially at Latin America, but if you move to a different region, would you will you be able to separate it from actual human One thing, I'm having some issues with your, your audio. I don't know if Jeremy could hear that, that question. Jeremy, you just got one minute if you could hear what there. Yeah, I got, I got the general gist. Um, sorry, I've got completely blank. Uh, could you maybe just repeat that? Um, I guess one is on the methodology and how you would separate uh, the, the sensitiveness to the, to the environment itself and as opposed to human uh, interruption. <laughs> Jeremy, I think um, your time is up. I wonder if you want to answer that in the chat. That might be a great option. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank you for all those amazing questions. James, do you want to introduce the next group just while I get the video ready? So the next uh, presentation is um, the, I'm just going to check my pronunciation. It's the Yarken project from Argentina. Um, we have, uh, they submitted a video um, over the weekend, so we're going to run that now, and then uh, Christian's going to take questions. So over to you, Stephen. Thank you. My name is Christian Gregorini. I'm director of Escuela de Fiscales, activist, SDG promoter, lawyer, and innovator. With the Open Data team, we create Sharkem Project which use open data for climate action. I am Luciana Ambrosio, promoter of the SDG, environmental activist and director of open data and citizen participation of the Escuela de Fiscales. Charquen is a Mapuche word, an original South American people that we know, an animal that represents we don't and that can see and fly in the dark. That is the object of the project, to allow civic society to open their eyes and see through the darkness generated by thousands of dataset published in dozens of official web pages. The Charken Project website aims to eliminate these barriers by allowing us available information to be accessed from one place, quicker, easily, and accessible. Sharkem Project consists of a website for civil society organizations, environmental activists, data journalists, and people interested in environmental issues. Using an IPI tool currently under development, access datasets for official websites of the national, provincial, and municipal government of Argentina. 
to later organize them in different categories and through an internal search engine and through simple search expressions allow easy access. This generates a maximum spread of information and data. The Sharken project aims to monitor open data published by the national, provincial and municipal governments. For this reason, the project mainly uses open government data. The project is mainly aimed at civil society organizations and environmental activists. It will be also very useful for data journalists. The project can be scaled at different levels. It can even be replicated in other countries with so minor modifications. For these goals to be achieved, all the necessary tools will be published with open source and licenses. In the next six months, we plan that the project will be running, passing all the testing stage of the web and the IPR tool. And once the website is fully operational, move to a second stage of a mobile app. This project would combine the simplicity of the user interface with the complexity of gathering an enormous amount of information in one place. Sharken project used the potential of open data to empower citizens, providing information and open knowledge. Fantastic. I especially like the nice cup of is it mate at the end that's offered. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. So let me just check if we have any questions for. So if any of the um, experts want to ask any questions, Christian, please, um, please unmute yourself and uh, ask away. I have one question that I, I guess could go to, to any of the other projects also. So if you want to answer in the chat room. Um, I know climate change data can be a little bit technical for people that are not within the climate change community. So do you have any project, any like side of the project that is aiming to kind of explain this data to non-climate change activists, citizens, and, and maybe even journalists? Well, thanks for the question, uh, Natalia. Great, great question. Uh, yes, uh, the Jargon project um, tried to, to give the, the civil society and all the people interested in, in environmental issues, uh, the, the open data and the open knowledge. So yes, um, it's very important for the project uh, to teach or, or, or show very, in, in, a, in an easy way uh, for the people who don't uh, work with open data and uh, the people who doesn't, uh, um, how, how can I say it, uh, uh, that it's not a um, technical uh, specialist in, uh, in, in environmental issues and, ch and climate change and, 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 and all the, all the questions, all the, um, the teams uh, that the project works. So yes, yes, uh, it's uh, we, we think it's very very important for the for the Sharken project uh, to teach the people how to use open data, how to to um, work with open data. Uh, yes, I, I hope uh, uh, that that can can be uh, that can be work. With, with this uh, portal, with, with this page uh, for all the people, not only experts or specialists in climate change or climate action. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, are there any, any other questions? Oh, so there's a question posed by Logan. Um, Logan, do you want to ask it yourself or do you want me to read? Yeah, I'm happy to ask. Um, so in my experience, the uh, datos.gov.r uh, website is, is actually has really good information um, and it's very well categorized. So I'm wondering particularly, very specifically, what the Yarquan or Yarquan website will have that the national level data portal does not. For instance, maybe visualization or maps of, of data. Yes. Um... Argentine uh, web pages of, of data sets uh, are very accessible, but uh, we, we don't have only one 
uh, portal. We have a national portals, provincial portals, municipal portals. So um, individually, all the, the portals are accessible and easy to use. Uh, nothing knows well that, uh, but um, all, the, all the portals together for the people uh, that not it's an expert in open data for um, for uh, activists for open or for um, or, uh, civil society organizations that not work with open data uh, the, the the existence of multiple portals in the three levels of government uh, that's that's that make a, a difficult access not only one portal, all the portals together are very difficult. So you can have uh, the information of a national, of a national level, but uh, maybe you can, uh, you need to, to work with a, an, a, an local uh, uh, information, a local open data. So that's, that makes it difficult for the people who don't, I repeat, who don't work or, or but, uh, it's not expert in the use of the, uh, open data. That's the difficult, the, the, the multiple, uh, the existence of multiple portals and websites. So Sharken Project wants to, to make one, only one point uh, for access all the information. So you can uh, search uh, any, any, any data set the Sharken project aims to, to work with all the uh, data sets existence in the, uh, in the Argentine, in the three levels of government, in the Argentine uh, websites. Okay, thank you, Christian. Uh, we've got one minute left. Any very quick questions from anyone? Can't see any posted on the chat. Okay. Maybe we'll move on to the next presentation. Thank you so much for that. James, you want to introduce the next, next speaker? Hi, uh, thanks, Christian. That was really great. Um, so our final um, pitch comes from a um, uh, Brazilian team. Um, the project's called, in English, Election Climate. And Beatrice, um, you're presenting live. So if you're ready to share your screen, um, over to you. And you've got three minutes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Let me just do my thing here. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Beatriz Pagi. I'm representing Clima de Eleição. We are a team of young professionals and climate activists working with the climate agenda for over three years now. Our project was created in the context of the 2020 municipal elections when we identified a governance gap in the federal level and the urgent need to capitalize climate action to other spheres. Uh, we saw that political will and effective public policies are the path for the biggest impact in people's lives. So we analyzed the recognition of climate change as an existing phenomenon in the 26 Brazilian capital cities governmental plans. In total, over 500 governmental plans were scanned in the, two last, uh, the last two municipal electoral cycles of 2020 and 2016. We organized all this data uh, in an accessible manner, going beyond writing a simple report and creating an interactive platform that you can see in our vi uh, virtual website. So let me pause this. So our data sets were created using official and public information provided by the Superior Electoral Court, which are mandatory to be disclosed since 2009 in Brazil. Then we used a quantitative methodology to scan climate-related keywords and made a detailed cross-checking of relevant parts of the plan, such as mobility and environment. Our uh, goal was to track climate progress and boost advocacy. According to the benefit stakeholders, the voters would have access to open data about the candidates and elected representatives to make informed decisions. Researchers can track how international negotiations reach the subnational level and monitor and map where climate politics are stronger or weaker. And finally, climate organizations from the civil society can engage with politicians to increase ambition, convert candidates that haven't internalized the agenda yet, and create advocacy plans more connected to their local realities. We believe that our project has a huge scalability potential and to make this as accessible as possible, we also made a publication explaining how to replicate the methodology. Everything is open source and uh, open to public use. We only request the proper attributions of credits. 
Furthermore, the initiative can be scaled to different electoral years, governmental spheres, cities and countries across the globe, and even thematics. Finally, our next steps in the following six months would be to extend the analysis to the three levels of government in the past three electoral cycles in Brazil, update our interactive platform with more analysis and different languages, create an automatized tool to interpret the governmental plans and translate the methodology to English and Spanish so it can be adapted to other realities. We thank you for your attention and invite you to also join us in increasing climate ambition through political will. Fantastic, thank you. And you still had about 10 seconds to spare. <laughs> Um, so I'll throw over, uh, do any of our panel of experts have any questions? Anyone, I'll just... Anyone in the audience have any questions about the project? I've got one actually, sorry. Um, I think, and I could be wrong, but I think you're in the middle of elections at the moment, or have you just had elections and have you seen people using your portal as part of their understanding to vote? Have you seen, what have you seen the hit, hit rate as and things? Um, we had elections in the last year and we're going to have elections again uh, in 2022. We saw that there were almost 2,000 access to the platform through the click in our link tree. So yes, I think that people use the platform. Great. There's again, there's a, a question from Logan. Uh, Logan, if you want me to, I can read it out. So he, he's asking, uh, what was the single largest challenge in combining the data from many reports, data schemas and meaningful comparisons? Question mark. Okay, so the biggest challenge was that governmental plans, they do not have a template. They do not have a standard in Brazil. Um, so this is one of the first challenges that we had to compile information that were not in specific spaces. The second thing is that even though many of the governmental plans are digital, there were a lot of scanned papers. So. Uh, we have we did not have a full digital transition so we had to really proofread the whole governmental plan and not only search for keywords when it came to those um, more traditional and paper hard copies of the plans great and we've got a further question from maria asking um do you also include any tracking of climate policies being implemented to assess the electoral commitments and whether they're happening well, our initial uh, scan was just if the climate crisis was recognized, but we do plan in a different project to actually have this tracking of climate policies being implemented, and especially a mapping of um, general templates and toolkits that other candidates and elected representatives could propose. So that's, there's a lot of municipalities in Brazil, it's over 5,000. So that's a little bit challenging. And also without the digital, uh, a centralized digital platform, you only have that in the federal level. But there are some initiatives that are already doing that and you want to boost that with the municipal initiatives as well. Okay, fantastic. And you got a thanks on the, on the chat there. <laughs> um, any final questions? We're getting down to the last couple of minutes, so maybe we'd have time for one more question if anyone wants to ask anything. No, no more questions? Okay. James, I think we're, we're done on time. Great. Thank you, Beatrice. Um, so uh, we've got uh, three minutes to go. I want to um, uh, just thank everyone who's um, attended today's event. I think it's been really, really exciting um, to hear about all these projects. It's actually been one of the best Zoom meetings I've ever attended. Um, so <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thank you for the pitch to the pitching teams who uh, participated. Thank you so much for the 
panel of experts who um, and to the audience for your amazing questions. Um, we, um, the panel of experts will be choosing the winner um, at some point in the next week. Um, so we'll get back to the pitch teams, um, hopefully towards the end of this week. Um, and um, we hope that, um, please do stay in touch. I'll send everyone who uh, registered for this event an email, um, just um, after the event to uh, keep you in, offer you the opportunity to stay in touch about the project. As, we, as I said, the Net Zero Challenge, uh, we're hoping that this will be a multi-year project. Um, this is just the first stage. We want to um, continue to give support and promotion to uh, projects that use open data uh, to advance climate action.